All right, let's get started, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, today, we're going to uh, have a seminar by Carrie Jennings. She joined the Freshwater Society in 2016. Before that, she was a field geologist for 24 years. Uh, she worked for 22 years with the Minnesota Geological Survey and um, two years with the DNR. Um, for the last two years, she was the science reports lead for the County Geologic Atlas program. And um, she applies her understanding of glacial geology and landscape evolution to shape policy and technical approaches for managing surface water and groundwater, avoiding hazards and using resources wisely. So we're very happy to have you and uh, we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you. So this is a new topic for me to give a talk on. I asked my executive director what I should talk about and he wrote a title. So I submitted the title back in January and have been backfilling the talk ever since. But it does make sense for me to talk about this now because um, the geology that I've done for most of my career is now being put to a very different use. And I want to start by just asking the question that you might be asking, which is, now I'm pressing page down and nothing is happening. Okay. There we go. Um, how are geology and politics related? And I'm going to go all the way back to the Mason-Dixon line, which is actually this line here, which I rediscovered when I was driving back from Tennessee last spring. It's a, it's a profound cultural boundary. But it's really based on a profound geologic boundary. That's essentially the glacial limit. Um, and even over here into this territory, that is the limit of how far the ice got in the last glaciation. And what do you think that controls that would control the politics so strongly? Dan knows, but I don't know if Dan can answer. Go ahead. Rivers, rivers, for sure. At rivers. And even uh, in addition to rivers, it's the whole landscape, what would the soil. It really has created a completely different soil type north of that line. And young rivers, young rivers that are still evolving to the changing landscape that was pushed across them. And more recently, um, you can see this and more locally in this upper Mississippi River anomaly that is from the presidential election from 2012. Um, it's just an odd little blue cluster in our region. And there actually has been a professor of geography who has been studying this for a long time in Madison. He's been looking at every presidential election since 1992. And this line stays there, that break between the red and the blue counties in Wisconsin. And that's the glacial limit in Wisconsin. So it's doing something. And that's something I maintain is kind of the underlying resources that a place has to deal with. So you're not going to be able to just change your economy very far from what you're actually dealt originally. And you're kind of stuck with that, that landscape, that geography. So here's where that region is. And I think you can see that there's a very different river system that's evolved in that part of Wisconsin and Minnesota. Um, the students I taught in glacial geology, actually, we're going to get an automatic um, as they call this part of Minnesota the Driftless Area because it's not. However, it is responding to the incision of the Mississippi River there and has these deeply incised tributaries uh, that we see in southeast Minnesota. So the way I prefer them, to, and you are here in this landscape. So the way I prefer to see these boundaries from a glacial point of view is these parts have never been glaciated. So this part east of the Mississippi and Wisconsin and west of the Missouri and the Dakotas. And then you have these parts that haven't been glaciated very recently, so they also have evolved drainage systems um, west of, well, this is the James River lowland in north and south Dakota, so west of there, but east of the Missouri River, an evolved landscape, but it still has glacial soils um, that are maybe more highly leached than soils in this last area, which has been very recently glaciated. And then there's another political issue brewing. The Brian Bowman and I were on the phone earlier today. There's some legislators from this part of the state that was recently glaciated, but then more recently flooded by a large glacial lake. And they're objecting to um, Minnesota Department of Agriculture's nitrate rule based on the grounds that it doesn't really um, help their farmers up there. And they don't have any groundwater that is being contaminated with nitrogen. So there are these 
geologic underpinnings in political issues that are being discussed this legislative session. So that's why my director thought that I would be an okay person to work on this job, even though I've spent most of the, my time in the field. So the impact of glaciation really is more than just the topography, the moraines and the flat spots, but all the watersheds and divides, the major ones especially, are probably glacial boundaries of some sort or another. And then the concentrations of lakes and the inherited river courses that we see are a result of glacial meltwater. Um, and even the continuing evolution of the watersheds, so it, how the Minnesota is responding differently than the Mississippi and the St. Croix and the Red Rivers, those are all inherited from this glacial legacy. Because you can start a process in motion 10,000 years ago and it's still evolving. Even those landscapes that were glaciated um, 100,000 years ago are still evolving in some ways. Um, and so the change we're seeing mostly now is from a dramatic change in local base level. So the deepest spot on the local landscape changed dramatically 13,000 years ago. And the rivers, in the, mainly the Minnesota River watershed, are still adjusting to that change. And then the final thing would be the parent material for all soil started off looking like something like this. Dan and I just had this discussion of how to best represent that at a display at the Bell Museum for the mammoth to stand on. <laughs> But this is what you started off with. Parts of the state may be glacial stream sediment that's sandy and, and not so clay. And that's what that's the, the hand you're dealt. So I spent most of my career, as um, Dave pointed out, mapping. These are little white boxes outlining my mapping area. So I covered most of the Minnesota River watershed, a lot of northeastern Minnesota, and I compiled a lot from the western part of the state. I could have kept doing that. It's really fun, actually, to have a two or three year long mapping project and just a truck and, and go because the way you approach it is you drive every road and you canoe every stream and review the soil maps, um, auger hundreds of shallow holes, maybe a few dozen holes to bedrock, um, which can be quite deep. Like in this part of the state, it's, it's um, almost a kilometer of glacial sediment. And then you also get to know the people when you're out there because it takes a long time to make these maps and need access to places and you get to know the locals. So I felt like as far as getting to know people, it's this part of the state that I really understand the people and the issues and the geology the best. So they are, they are kind of um, grateful to understand how their region is still responding to this glacial history because it affects them in very obvious ways. So here we have, in case you haven't located yourself, Twin Cities is up here. This is in Cato. Basically, the check mark down here. This is all Minnesota River Basin. What happened? Um, let me just show you a little bit of the terrain. So this, I'm going to show you this moraine terrain, which is in uh, like Rice County, and then I'll show you a glacial lake plain, which is the flat upland down here in Fleur County, and I think I'm going to show you a view into the Yellow Medicine River. So this is the moraine terrain. Um, this part of Rice County was settled by Irish and Czech people, and I think that the glacial landscape also controls settlement patterns in some ways because people are comfortable in a landscape that they've come from if they're still a, mem a memory of the homeland. So this moranic area is dotted with lakes, steep slopes. You're not going to have big agriculture here because it's just the, the fields are so small and broken up and the slopes are steep. So there's um, a lot of pasture, lake development. That contrasts with Blue Earth County. This is the glacial lake plain I refer to in Blue Earth County. About as flat as you can get, very heavy clay soils, and um, you know nothing to get in the way of farming as if you can get the water off that landscape because it kind of sits tabletop and doesn't drain very well. And then you have the deeply incised tributaries to the Minnesota River, and this is the Yellow Medicine River just south of Granite Falls. And these are natural um, bluffs that have exposed a million years worth of glacial sediments here. The most recent sediment is just the top couple meters from the last glaciation. So that's the, the legacy of the Minnesota River, uh, or the, the geologic legacy before the incision of the big base level change. So this is a drainage of a glacial lake, glacial lake Agassiz, which suddenly, from a geologic point of view, um, created this very deep valley because there was just a, an outburst event from that lake. And it cut into this rather flat landscape, creating waterfalls at the mouth of all these tributaries. 
And ever since this happened, 13,000, this is, those are radiocarbon years. It was more like 13,400 calendar years, 11.5 radiocarbon. Um, these tributaries have been adjusting their gradients to that base level change. So eventually, this part of the Minnesota River watershed will look like southeastern Minnesota, that not driftless area in southeastern Minnesota. That's the goal. That might take 100,000 years um, if you have kind of normal circumstances. But if you change anything about the way these tributaries receive water, you're going to change the rate of this process. And the process is one of headward migration of mixed points, so the waterfall that started right at the edge is going to be working its way up into the landscape, unzipping into the landscape, and it does that kind of proportional to the watershed area that's draining through that. And then that stream delivers sediment to the Minnesota River Valley floodplain that might stay locally as a fan and fill in the floodplain, or it might make its way through the very much smaller Minnesota River down to a holding place, which would be Lake Pepin. And this is a really fun watershed to canoe. Um, all the watersheds in the Minnesota River are great up until like July 1st because then they don't have enough water in them and you hit these rocks. But the streams, they're weird. They're like upside down because the lower reaches of the streams have these really rocky bottoms and very steep slopes. It's kind of what you would expect from a, a, a stream high in the mountains. And then the upper reaches are really flat and lazy. So it's the opposite of what you expect. So you see these, the, the bed of the stream is a boulder lag that's from the eroded till, and there's actually till underneath the stream. It's not a sand, a sand bed here. And this is the kind of exposure that I'm looking for when I'm canoeing, is just to understand what glacial sediment is exposed and sample it and understand the history. And there's um, one, two, probably three or four units there that look exactly alike. So um, it's kind of subtle, and you have to do a lot of sampling. But still, you can appreciate the beauty of it. But when I was doing this mapping down here, um, a friend that Dan and I know who works at the Pollution Control Agency that I went to grad school with here at the U said, um, we're having this TMDL process for the Minnesota River. We've got the sediment loading issue in the Minnesota, and we'd like to understand how much of this is natural and how much of this has changed recently. Isn't this a geologic problem? And I was like, yeah, it is a geologic problem. Um, so I started working on building some teams to do some applied projects following this mapping in this area. I'm really glad that Dan's in the room because he's on one of the important teams. So the questions were, you know, what is causing these changes to the um, Minnesota River Basin and how much is natural, how much is um, human influence? And the natural ones that we know about are that precipitation changes have occurred across the basin. And I like to think of um, the prairie forest border as being kind of parallel to this steep change in the gradient of precipitation. You know, the eastern part of the state is wet and the west is dry. Um, this shows how it was, we've become wetter recently. Um, if we were to go back 10,000 years, we could make an even more extensive change in this precipitation gradient, and you can do that by looking at the sediment cores in lakes and the pollen in those lakes. And we know that at one point, the prairie forest border, this is like during the Dust Bowl, extended all the way over to Grandsburg, Wisconsin, and all of this part of Minnesota, where there were sand, was whipped up into sand dunes. So there have been lots of changes. And that means changes to the water to the Minnesota River, which mean changes to the erosion of these nick points. So we can see those and document those. Um, we also know that there are places where water is stored on the landscape, but we don't have as many of those as we used to. So that's a change that we can document. Um, the, we can see what the original distribution of wetlands was like if we look back at the original data from the land surveyors. Has anyone ever looked at that online? All those original maps are scanned, so you can find them in the Digital Conservancy and see their notes and their outlines of these lakes and rivers, how wide certain streams were. But these are the, this is the distribution of wetlands they match. So the, the dark brown is wet prairie, and there's open lakes, and there's one more category that's, that's wet, but mostly it's maybe this wet prairie category. So it's like 30% of the area was wetland, meaning that you have water slowly soaking into maybe the heavy tills, maybe some going back to the atmosphere um, through evapotranspiration. Early in the settlement of this area, um, people were encouraged to drain the, these wetlands. You know, that this was funded from the 1800s on, and so you see those ditches being maintained now. I also spend a lot of time looking at ditches just because this one's great. Can you tell what this is 
quote in here? Catherine. Anybody who's had a geology background? See this? Can you see this land later? That's a glacial lake sediment. So they're ditching. It makes sense to me. This is layers of silt and clay that are a couple inches thick. So they're having to ditch through that and maybe tile drain that area because otherwise water would just sit on the surface and make it really hard and really sticky, messy farming. So we've drained through ditches. We've drained through tiling. Um, Sean Totler, who works at the St. Croix Watershed Research Station, I'm playing to Dan because he works there, um, says that this is the biggest infrastructure project since the interstate highway system, and it's mostly completely invisible to us. It's, you, know, you all know about tiling, right? Um, and then we have changed the pattern of evapotranspiration significantly so that most of the year there is none, um, and that there's these dark surfaces. And then we've even got more efficient about delivering water to ditches by pumping um, if there's a low spot that we want to get it out or send it straight to the ravine if you've got them or maybe just straight to the stream. So this has all increased the efficiency of the drainage system in a way that might have taken 100,000 years if we had left it up to the rivers to evolve into it because they would have eventually drained everything anyway, like southeast Minnesota. But this has happened really fast. And so it's not, not a surprise that if you, no matter how you looked at the normalized flow in the Minnesota River, whether it's the seven day mean annual peak or the um, high flow, they've all gone up. They've all gone up kind of along with the wetland drainage, the ditching, the change in precipitation, and the tiling. So it's unraveling that has been the topic of some other research papers um, by Sean Schottler and others. So that's resulted in these reasons that the PCA was stepping in. Um, the streams are impaired because of sediment loading. Um, this is the uh, Alexander Ramsey Park in Redwood Falls. It's not the actual Redwood Falls, it's the Alexander Ramsey Falls that's a tributary, but that was after a couple days of rain in May. The fields had been planted, but nothing really had a canopy. It was just coming up. It's a lot of sediment. Um, and the impairments are being felt not just in aquatic life but trying to live in those streams, but downstream in the reach of the Minnesota between Chaska and Fort Snelling. So just that straight shot before it hits the Mississippi, um, that's still a navigation channel. And the people that are responsible for keeping that open for barges are having a lot of problems with that. And it's not just the inconvenience. This is the, those terminals do ship a lot of commodities in and out for agriculture. So we've got loads of freight that can't go out and can't get back in if, if that channel is not maintained. So at Chuck's urging, um, I asked a bunch of people to kind of form teams and do some studies in the watershed. And this we did five separate proposals. One was NSF funded. The others mostly came with state money through the PCA. Um, they were mostly multi-year proposals. Some of them were three years long. Some of them have gone on for more than a decade now. Um, multi-institutional, and I'll explain why um, in a little bit. So we've got tons of publications out there, several graduate degrees, launched careers. People have got, gotten kind of famous from this work in the Minnesota River to the point where, you know, if I show up somewhere, people ask about the Minnesota River watershed or even the Lesseur River. <coughs> Geologists and, you know, at meetings in California know this region. Um, and there's ongoing work in other watersheds based on this. And this work as a kind of suite was changed with, or credited with changing the conversation. And I'll explain why now. Here's one of my really good pictures of Dan. So one of the, uh, and I love this turquoise boat from the PCA. If you ever want to demonstrate that the PCA doesn't waste money, they still have a turquoise boat like from the 1970s. Um, but one of the projects started with the recoring of Lake Pepin because um, it had been a decade since it was cored, and it was unclear if the sediment loads were staying high or if they'd gone back a little bit. So that was one of the projects with the St. Croix Watershed Research Station. And parallel to that basin, the sink for the sediment, was a project to look at field erosion in the upland parts of the Minnesota River watershed and see how that had changed. And that was to look at these temporary storage sites in rivers, little ponds, um, mucky places in the Minnesota River, and date the sediment there and understand what the field loads were. And this is a quick summary slide from Sean about that project. Basically, it is using cesium and lead to 10 methods to look at sediment that's recently been exposed and where that's stored. And 
it looks like the watersheds, all the different watersheds in Minnesota have kind of comparable field loads. Um, and we include the South Fork of the Crow, it's up here, but geologically very similar, even though it drains to the Mississippi. And then Lake Pepin's getting about 22% field load sediment, so something that's recently seen led to 10 and so young sediment. So that's the green down here. So the yields from these different watersheds across the Minnesota are kind of similar in how much um, field sediment is coming off of them, and that looks like a small amount. And the proportions vary a little bit because most of the sediment coming into Lake Pepin now is not from fields, it's from these other sources, the non-field sources. So that would mean sources that are shielded from rain, deeper sources. So you're looking at less, more deeply buried sources, or maybe sources where sediment has been stored for a while, and the season in lead to 10, which are radioactive, have gone dead. So something stored for a long time. So that was one of the projects. So this is the suite of projects that I, it's kind of my the, the applied projects that are the science backgrounds for my policy work I'm doing now. The second one um, was a project in the Lesur watershed. This is as Peter Wilcox, who was the the Yoda of this project, or the, you know he wasn't really the PI, but he was kind of the scientific head of it. He talks about this being the beating muddy heart of the Minnesota River Basin. This is three rivers, the Maple, Cobb, and Lesur that come in south of Mankato to the Blue Earth, but the sediment yield from this watershed is, is very, very high. We chose, they, I convinced Peter to study this watershed instead of the Chesapeake when he was visiting Minnesota. Um, he, at the time, he was part of the National Center for Earth Surface Dynamics at the University of Minnesota. And we decided that the project to do here would be to create a total sediment budget for the Lesur watershed, understand where everything is coming from as it leaves the mouth of this river. So the NSED um, was a 10-year NSF-funded site that was convening experts in geomorphology topics from across the country, mostly river-oriented topics. So we had people, he was from Johns Hopkins, we had people from Seattle, Washington, we had people from um, Colorado, uh, uh, Illinois, just kind of the big experts across the country. Um, somebody asked me how I got the geomorphology dream team to work on my river. It really felt like that. So it was Peter Karen Grant, who's now at UMG. Patrick Belmont, you hear his name a lot. He was a postdoc we hired for this project, um, taught him to canoe. He, he lost one of my canoes, still a little noise. Um, he bought a new one for us, but still. <laughs> Gary Parker, who was um, at the St. Anthony Falls lab, and I took fluvial mechanics from years and years ago, is now Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. Um, and then we have MS and PhD students from across the country working on this watershed, and that's why it's become kind of famous. Um, so the, the budget is, what are the sediment sources in this flat watershed that ha is extensively ditched and tiled, has um, central streets deeply incised with a history of incision for the last 10,000 years, and then these new ravines that keep growing off the mainstream as the Nick Point passes it. So we looked at um, the low gradient uplands, and we're using cesium and lead to 10 methods to estimate those sediment loads. We looked at the ravines as sources and the growth of the ravines. That was a master's project. Um, PhD project on the bluffs, how quickly the bluffs are retreating using um, repeat LIDAR scans of the bluffs and imagery how much was coming from the stream banks, so it had been stored for a while in the stream banks, but then was coming out again because the streams are widening or meandering more quickly. And then um, adding all those up. Oh, the terraces. So, you know, once a terrace is abandoned. So these are all distinct sources that we could identify by a variety of means. And the reason this was such an attractive watershed to do this in is because these three rivers, the um, Maple, the Cobb, and the Lesur, which are coming together right up there, have gauges where these little triangles are. So they really have, they were gauged for 30 years, thanks to the PCA down in that region, mostly Pat Bassfield. And so you could see how much sediment is coming in before the stream goes into this deeply incised reach, and then how much it picks up in the deeply incised reach. And the Maple was really instructive in this area because its watershed is only like a mile wide here. So if there's sediment coming in and that size reach to the maple, it's coming from the activity of that stream against the bluffs in the incised reach. 
So the way we were able to apportion the sediment after three years, actually they did a fourth year of bluff monitoring because so it's kind of dry, was most of the sediment is coming in between the gauges in the, from the bluff. The ravine source, because it was dry for two or three of the years, um, it's less constrained, but much less upland sources and floodplain sources kind of swamped by the bluff sources. So that's the part that um, changed the conversation, at least at the state level. And, and I know that Satish and others, Dave, were involved in this as well. The PCA was convening quite a few meetings of people that have worked in the area because it's no longer a question of, or it's no longer a management practice of like leaving stubble on a field that's going to reduce this. You know, you're talking now about something completely different. You're talking about flow to the rivers. And so that, that's a game changer. Most rivers um, have experienced significant widening down there. And again, you can go back beyond 1939. That's about the oldest air photo you can look at. But you can go back to those original surveyor's records and see how many rods wide some of these rivers are. But we've had um, sometimes 200% widening of these streams, um, affecting lots of parcels. So there's a history of... Um, affected parcels in that region. That might be, that's Medelia. I was thinking it might be Vernon Center, which has its own issues right now. You have heard about that. It's, it's also speeded up the meander migration rate. So that's making these bluffs more active. And on average, if you just average it over all the bluff extent for those incised reaches, it's eroding at six inches a year, these bluffs are, which translates to 80 acres washing down uh, the Minnesota River, just 80 acres of you know, area. I'm not talking about the volume. And that gets the attention of people that are farming that region. I mean, it's gotten the attention of people living along those bluffs for a long time um, because they're losing land. So that was a three or four year project. The next project by that group, I had moved on um, to the DNR. They decided to apply the same practice to the whole Blue Earth Basin. The greater Blue Earth Basin is not just the Lake Shore, but it includes the Blue Earth River and the Watton Lawn River. Slightly different geologically, more bedrock control in the blue earth, and the Watton Lawn's a little sandier at the surface in places. So they have slightly different loads, but still, you're looking at a significant, you know, portion of bluff erosion. So those were also closed sediment budgets. You know, we know how much is coming from these places. So you know, we know the budgets, we know the biggest source. So let's go, right? Let's get some things on the ground. Let's make it happen. Well, fortunately, the second project that expanded the lows to the greater Blue Earth also knew that there was going to be some barriers to change in the landscape. So they built some more tools into their proposal. Um, they recognized that this does not prioritize the solution, and you're going to have to try to model the outcomes to get people to put practices in place. And this is a really challenging modeling program. You know, you can't just do a SWOT model for everything. Um, there's a question of sediment delivery. Is all the sediment that's being generated in the watershed actually leaving the watershed? How do you model that? Um, if the biggest sediment sources are near bluff, um, how are you going to reduce that source? Are you going to armor the toe of the bluff or reduce the high flow, which is better? If you're going to reduce high flow, where are you going to do that in the watershed? And what's the cost of all these different management options and how efficient are they? And do they interact with one another? So you, you can't just add up all these management options and say you're going to reduce sediment to zero um, without really understanding the interactions. And then when we presented the results of this um, model to a group initially, a group of stakeholders, they said, well, I don't care just about sediment. I want to reduce nitrate, too. So how are you going to help me reduce nitrate? So we have to think about other benefits other than sediment reduction that might be wanted. So this is where I kind of pivot into the to help the, the watersheds plan. And for well-informed planning and prioritization of decisions, we have to estimate for them how much sediment and at what cost. How much is going to be reduced? How much is it going to cost them or the state? And this, the, this stage of the project um, that Peter Wilcock was, again, still kind of the guru of, he loves acronyms. This is scissors, which was meant to cut sediment. Nobody gets that. I don't think they know how to pronounce that acronym. but. Collaborative for Sediment Source Reduction. And this turned out to be also a very long project that kind of dribbled on for an extra year and a half at least because they really wanted to get a model in the hands of the people in the watershed that were going to be working on this. They wanted to ident identify specific strategies to reduce sediment loading and use a, a decision-making framework 
and the best science and agree on the costs and the strategy. They wanted everyone who attended the stakeholder meetings to actually sign on. <laughs> and then they wanted to try to um, find a model that could be used in the rest of the Minnesota River watershed, which has smaller loads but still is an issue. So let me get some water. So this is the, um, the little logos of all the people that were involved and some of the players, um, Patrick Belmont, Karen Grant, Pat Bassfield from the watershed district, Corps of Engineers, there's Peter Wilcox on the right. Uh, I think that guy, you know all these names, Dave, I can't think of, he's a corn grower guy, but you know, these people kept meeting again and again. They came to Mankato and sat in that student union room again and again to look at the models that these people were developing, understand what the science under the hood, and so they would buy in and ultimately uh, agree to use the results of the model. This was work funded by the Department of Ag primarily with clean water funds. So uh, these are some slides from Peter's um, talk, most recent talk about the challenges of this modeling. And some of you are involved in modeling, and maybe you'll appreciate this. So the sediment delivery prob problem is was probably a master's thesis or maybe a PhD, but you really have to parcel up all the little sub watersheds and think about the topography and where the local sources and sinks are, and map where the sediment grain is going, and will it stay in a little sink locally, or will it exit its watershed? So that was a huge modeling effort. Another one of the modeling efforts was to look at how the river discharge per area of watershed scaled to the sediment supply coming from the inside and so on. So you increase the river flow and up until a point, and then you increase it a lot, and you start getting all the sediment. So they call this their hockey stick diagram. And the kind of elucidating point of this graph is that if you can just dial back the flow a little bit, reduce the peaks, you're going to handle those near channel sources in the bluffs. If you can just turn that river back down a little bit. And when you're modeling that, you know, you're thinking about, oh, we can save this bluff from eroding further. Um, but you have to account for the bluffs like in Mankato that are already being saved by cement walls, or those that are being riprapped, or those that are being controlled with structures at their toe. So they were trying to look at all these different management options and lump them into types of management options, like the ones that are being applied on the field to reduce sediment source from there, the ones that are being applied um, to reduce stream de uh, sediment delivery from the field to the street, so like a grass waterway, and the ones that are being applied to reduce near channel sources. So they're basically creating a model where you can only dial certain knobs on it turn these management practices on and off, have them cover certain areas, um, but in a very smart way. So you can look at these field management options. Um, you can look at the ones that are to keep the sediment from leaving the field and going to the stream. You can look at the management options that are working on ravines, like by controlling flow, little check dams into the ravines. And then those that are protecting the toe of the bluff and those that are reducing peak discharge. And then accounting for the interactions is probably another master's degree. I'm not sure who worked on that, but you can't say that if you reduce a little sediment with your buffer and your grass waterway and your field that you, those are additive. You know, you probably already stopped the sediment coming from one of those to the other. So they're accounting for those interactions in the same way that you can't say that you're reducing sediment by dialing back the flow if you've already protected the toe. It makes sense. So they're thinking about these things. And they're not done yet because you also have to determine where each one of these management options can be applied in the watershed. So that had to be very carefully assessed. You know, where are the depressional areas for in field storage? Where are the, the bluffs that can be protected? Lots of stuff. And then they still want it to be a simple model to use, so they're kind of dividing these three major rivers into the areas where those management options can be applied. The steep walled river in size reaches, and then the upland areas, and then the transitional areas in between. And the model that has been presented is an Excel spreadsheet that looks like this. And I know you can't see everything in this, but um, it divides the management options into the three major rivers and the types, tillage management, field management, buffer strip management, water conservation, in-channel, ravine, and near-channel. 
and it already knows the extent of the acres that can be applied. And so you, there are limits to what you can choose, but you can say what percent of the area you want to have a conventional kill and maybe some ravine control. And then you can even <coughs> set the cost for how much that is. Like you might know what the price of land is if you want to actually outright purchase a property for conservation practice. And then you just you get a number. You you play, you turn those few knobs, and then you can see what kind of sediment reduction you're going to get for what cost. And the cheapest thing you can do is control the ravines. This is 10 years worth of management on the ravines. Um, what or I'm sorry, it's it's up to 100% implementation. So we start with just 5% implementation and go to 100%. It's not very expensive. It stays kind of the same price per year but you're not going to reduce very much sediment overall by controlling the ravines. They're just not that big of an area on the landscape. And if you look at something else that's kind of expensive up there on the top, um, which is, friend, what's the, uh, I forget what, is that the buffers? That's the buffers. Um, pretty expensive and not a lot of sediment reduction, about the same amount you would get for the ravines. That's assuming probably purchase of those lands or you know taking them out of production. And then in between, you see these other management options like these are water control structures, you know, fairly um, level annual cost, and you're getting some sediment reduction with those. So the result is um, actually Brian and some other students, is anybody else from your team in the room? They, he really went after this is turning that graph on its side. So instead of the X and sediment reduction and cost. We flipped it, and so it's sediment reduction here. So the higher, the better, and cost here. So the farther to the left, the better. You want a steep curve there. So Brian and some students was that last year for Joe Magner's class and John Neuber's class. So they dove into this model and actually developed every single possible scenario for sediment reduction in the watershed, and estimated the cost of reduction per milligram of, or megagram of sediment. So you can see that it's possible to get a 25% sediment reduction by a variety of mechanisms in this watershed. If you try to meet the Mississippi River turbidity goal, it's going to get a lot more expensive, $10.8 million. It's kind of doubling the price there. No, not quite. Not too much more. It's free. This is free. Okay. And why is it free? Oh, it's negative. And then for the Lake Pepin and Minnesota River turbidity goal, it's almost impossible to achieve 90% reduction, um, even if you spend a lot of money. So this is kind of instructive because I do think this is a useful tool and it's useful to understand the cost, but it's also useful in knowing that you, we can't buy our way to clean water. It's not going to happen. We know which, which practices work, but we can't just outright buy them. We can't pay for them. So that's where the policy and the politics and the influence on the landscape comes in. So currently what we're trying to do at Freshwater is try to um, create a policy environment that supports these pr proven practices by sharpening the state investment strategies. You know, there's this clean water fund that was instituted by um, this constitutional amendment. It lasts until 2034. So we're kind of getting halfway to the halfway point in the spending there. Um, people are expecting to see improvements, but actually the first part of this um, Clean Water Fund spending has mainly been to understand the project or the problem, to frame it and do the monitoring and kind of say where things are worst. So we're trying to reconvene the people that initially um, helped get that constitutional amendment passed and say, okay, What's the next, what's the second half? What are we doing now? How are we going to actually see changes so that maybe this doesn't even sunset in 2034? Maybe we have a continuing fund to address clean water issues. Um, and so in general, the question is how should the state money be prioritized to get the biggest bang for the buck? Currently, the budgeting process, and this is where it gets into the weeds, but it really are weeds, they're weeds we have to understand. Each agency, like DNR and Bowser at TCA and Health, they all submit a separate budget, a separate suite of things they want to have the Clean Water Fund promote. Clean Water Council is a group of people that are appointed by the governor from different walks of life 
that are making these recommendations to the legislature for how this money should be spent. If you get all the agencies talking together and, and agreeing on a budget, not competing for money, and Clean Water Fund giving a really strong stamp on that and promoting it to the legislature, then it's probably a package that the legislature's not going to mess with. But that's not what's been happening recently. So they usually recommend this menu of projects, but last time it was a menu of like 100 projects. And it was just a little too much to comprehend, and the legislator has been significantly revising the request for funding and ending up with funding projects that probably that weren't in the original recommendation, taking clean water funds for other things that some people think should just be coming from other money, general fund money from the state. And it's a little bit of a mess, and it's, the result has been that not always the best projects are funded. So we're trying to help these, these commissioners of the DNR and other commissioners and the people that have influence at the legislature think about how to prioritize the, the money. <laughs> In some cases, because of the one watershed, one plan efforts, which it sounds like you guys are familiar with, right? Um, you know, locals will probably be advancing projects in the Cedar River watershed they would like to see funded. So should the state prioritize money to what the locals want to have funded? That's one um, approach. Or maybe the projects that the locals advance that also align with overarching state goals. But what are those overarching state goals besides clean water or 25 by 25? I mean, we need more than slogans to really understand um, what should be funded. I have to say that it does look like there's going to be a shift from studies and models to implementation projects, and that's probably good for an applied um, degree like probably the one you're getting here. Um, it's not so great if you're, you know, you just want to do another 10-year round of monitoring on all the rivers. That's probably going to be a uh, diminishing um, funding string there. Or do you want to focus like on watersheds that are still good? In this map, you can see the ones that are have more clean streams as opposed to more polluted streams. It's a very simplistic <coughs> map, but there's a lot of talk right now about um, focusing on the nearly barely, the ones that are barely impaired, um, the headwaters of the Mississippi, like the Pineland Sands area that's being converted from forest to fields right now. You know, do we focus on keeping that clean instead of looking down here to the Minnesota River watershed where there's not a lot of buy-in on conservation projects? And the water's so far gone that it would take a lot of money thrown at that area to see even a small improvement. So those are the discussions that are happening now. Um, and do we want to favor projects maybe with multiple benefits? Like I mentioned earlier, for example, if you appropriately place water on the landscape, you can reduce flow and that near-channel erosion. You can reduce sediment from those sources and other sources. You can reduce the phosphorus that's attached to the sediment, the particulate phosphorus. You can reduce nitrogen if they're properly designed kind of series of wetlands. This is a new paper by Amy Hansen that came out of the same St. Anthony Falls lab that I was looking at. Um, so, you know, maybe that's what the state should be buying into is some of these multiple benefit projects. Um, that's still being discussed. We have one more meeting with these kind of leaders, thought leaders, on how to write up a report that will hopefully guide the Clean Water um, Council in their funding request this session. Um, but then you enter the political process, and you know it's even hard to know how to enter the political process. I think um, some people think you have to show up at the Capitol, and there certainly are nonprofits that I talk to every day, like the Friends of the Mississippi, that think the best thing to do is to get all their members to show up at the Capitol on Water Day and be noisy, or meet with legislators individually and tell them their issues, or write letters. And that is an approach that does work. That brings issues to like the general public's eye. Um, that's not what we do at Freshwater. Um, we tend to work behind the scenes. Um, we don't go over and lobby directly. I'm not allowed to lobby. I'm not registered, but my director is. But um, we tend to try to influence maybe the same legislators, but in a different way. Um, we have uh, the executive branch, which is not just at Governor Dayton, but we have the executive branch of the appointed commissioners of all the agencies. So sometimes we work at that level or the assistant commissioner level or maybe our friends who are middle in the these agencies and we try to get their ideas promoted um, through the agencies. We'll enter the agencies at any level that we think is appropriate to try to get the, the right budget and work done. Um, Anne Henderson, who's the governor's water advisor, TA the class I teach over at the uh, Minneapolis campus, social geology, maybe about 10 years ago. So 
we, we can talk to her. Um, it turns out she's not been really um, strategic about how they're looking at water management, um, at least, you know, they've run all those sessions, the 25 by 25 listen sessions, but it's not clear where that's leading right now. Uh, but we do feel like we have a line. So we'll work those those conversations, those lines as much as we can. Um, what I've done more is testify at uh, legislative commissions. You get a little talk or a report out, and then you can get invited into, like, the Ag Commission is meeting next week to talk about the nitrate rule. This is the Legislative Water Commission, and it was a conversation. I think this one was about wastewater treatment plants in rural Minnesota, but we've talked to them about sediment loading to the Minnesota River and that model I was just describing. So a lot of funding decisions, a lot of legislative priorities emerge from these small groups within the legislature. So it's not just like standing in the hall or talking to the full body. It's getting a really tight package that comes out of these commissions. And what I tend to do at Freshwater is summarize um, science in publications that are understandable to the legislators or their staff and the general public or whatever level of government we're trying to reach. It might be a city water plant manager or it might be a county commissioner, but they're, they're meant to be simple kind of executive summaries of the issue and what specific approaches they can take on the issue are. And then I'm, you always have to avoid the political pitfalls too. Um, it doesn't make any sense to pit rural against urban areas. You, this is Mankato and you know that's a very clear divide, but um, you're just gonna lose support on both sides of the aisle and if you, if you start running into those. Even like Pepin has a problem because you're pitting someone's recreational opportunities on Lake Pepin against someone's livelihood in the Minnesota River Basin. So I see some political issues in promoting the use of Lake Pepin. That's my vote, by the way. Um, and then um, you see there's pitfalls in both of these approaches, recommending voluntary approaches to conservation practices because they don't tend to work, or making mandatory approaches like the buffer law, which results in a lot of pushback politically. So. You know, you have to think carefully about what you're asking the legislature to do. Um, and what we're trying to do right now as we're focusing on agricultural practices, conservation practices, is to recognize that farming doesn't exist in a vacuum. That these farmers are making decisions on their farms that are best for their bottom line and best for their, um, their fields, their local setting. You know, they're not willingly going out there and destroying things. And the number of influences that they have to consider in these decisions are huge. This is a kind of interesting graph from the future of Midwest agriculture. This was a thing that Nick Jordan arranged, a two-day session um, last fall, where he got a bunch of people in the ag world together with a facilitator from Australia to talk about the future of Midwest agriculture. I was really inspired by this, but he said that you know the importance of certain issues affecting farming decisions um, is you have to weigh that against the uncertainty of how these are going to happen, how likely it is that they'll happen. Like extreme weather events are really important to a farmer, but how do you predict those? Um, changing consumer demand, like gluten-free, you know, that, that impacted certain types of farmers a lot, but how could you have predicted that, that that diet would just take off and go crazy? Um, Consolidation of ag, the farm bill is another huge driver of what farmers can do out there. There's a little more certainty to that, but these are all the influences of what that farmer's planting. It doesn't, it's not just how to conserve water or how to make water quality better. They have to really um, balance all these other economic drivers in their decisions. And if you ask this, they ask this group that was assembled for the future Midwest agriculture, which are the most significant factors and when will they actually affect us? Now is the answer for all of these things. Changing long-term weather, urbanization, robotics in the fields, drones, high-tech farming, um, workforce skills and shortages, and changing consumer demands. So looking at that, that actually gives you, you know, if you look at this, these scenario shaping clusters of drivers, if you look at these drivers from a nonprofit point of view, and say, how can I act? Which which of those can I actually change? You know, how can I actually change a farmer's decision by maybe shifting where one of these dots lies on this graph, shifting the certainty of it or shifting the importance of it? And one of the things that is changing agriculture right now is 
the market, you know, and so how social norms are changing out there on the landscape. Um, so the sustainability branding that the, especially the agri industry in Minnesota is trying to put on their products is having a huge impact. You know, we have our, our car gills and our general mills and their consumers are demanding certain um, transparency uh, aspects to their products. Like, is it local? Is it sustainable? Um, will it survive climate change in this region? And we could ask those same brands to consider the water a clean water aspect of their product. Um, our personal choices, I mean, everyone in this room has the power to affect this kind of change. I was stunned when last time I went to the Capitol, went by the White Castle that's up there in university. They have black bean burgers now. I mean, who would have predicted that the home of the slider, you know, the greasy hamburger would shift its product so much. They, they also have veggie burgers, veggie and black bean burgers. So. They didn't do that because they just thought this will be a good idea. They did that because they saw these people lining up at Chipotle, you know, and they want to they want to access that market. At that future of Midwest agriculture, we were told that the future is the millennial female and the choices they're making for protein. So it's like it's it's the non-meat sources of protein that are are affecting what people are putting in the ground, you know, as early as next year. So I'll end with my title again, you know, this is not an exact science, there's certainly plenty of science out here in the watershed, but it's really where the money is, how it trickles down, the people and the politics that affect how water management actually occurs. So you'll finish your master's thesis and think, I'm going to make this huge impact, but it's really got to have legs, someone's got to take it out there, someone's got to make sure that it gets delivered to the right people and funded. So, you know, I still fundamentally believe that the geology and natural resources and climate are a region are the fundamental controls of what can be done. Um, and we can understand the natural process that affect a region and how we're impacting them, like accelerating erosion that would have already occurred, but we're giving it more water. But that's not enough to get people to change what they do. It's certainly easy for me to stop there and just do a geology lecture. I love doing that anywhere in the Minnesota Basin, but you can't stop there. You have to know who is making their decisions and why. And then you have to lead and affect change without authority or money, which is what we try to do. Um, I'm the only scientist, PhD scientist at Freshwater. Everyone else is like a facilitator because they try to get people to talk and they try to understand all the barriers to change that are in the room. And then it's really about those people and their decision making and the ability to be flexible or not. Um, so here's my reference to an ancient film. Anybody who laughs is over 50. <laughs> What's the film? Soil and green, it's people don't watch it. <laughs> so the role for a nonprofit like Freshwater is to make sure the right budget recommendations are promoted and passed the legislature. That's what we're doing right now. Help organize local governments like the Cedar into effective partnerships. These one watershed, one plan areas are now forming these joint powers agreements, different counties trying to work together. This hasn't happened before. They don't trust each other necessarily, and they have to figure out how to share decision making, how to share money and prioritize projects that might not be in their areas. We're helping those people do that. We're still communicating the relevant science to these people, local influencers, politicians, and staff, and we're helping propose realistic solutions for that specific area, and that's where your thesis might come in, um, and connecting local governments with the funding. And then we also try to check in with them periodically and say, yay, you're doing a great job, and, and let the rest of the state know that that's what they're doing. So I think that's my last slide. At the end. So we've uh, used up quite a bit of our time today. Um, and I know this topic uh, could generate a lot of discussion. <laughs> if there's anybody that's really not interested in the discussion, I'm just going to leave now. You can leave now. I'll be uh, really yeah. offended. <laughs> <laughs> Really save you a lot of money from doing this. 
And I think that's the sales pitch you need to make to the legislature. And even with Forever Green, um, I hear people on the landscape saying, or out in the legislature or in the corporate world, they need a sales pitch. You know, they need to tell us how that affects our bottom line. So we need to get better as a university making those pitches. Yep. You expect a different result. Yeah. No. Really good point. Can you testify on Tuesday to the Ag Committee about nitrates and BMPs? <laughs> 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 three, three o'clock. Nitrates are actually legislators out there and that that's a, a group that you need to reach different ways and that's what we try to do we try to turn everything into a fiscal argument and an empowerment of farmers decision-making local decision-making arguments um, the other thing I learned from a study recently by May Davenport and DNR about management decisions done at the local government level county and city out in the greater Minnesota um, Academic arguments don't work very well for those water managers. About half of them have college degrees or less. You know, they some haven't finished high school, some have high school, some have two-year vocational degrees, and they're managing water decisions at a local and county level. You know, there are some people with advanced degrees, but there aren't that many with advanced degrees out there. So translating your science is really important, and not coming in as I know everything is also very important. Acknowledging that there's a lot of knowledge in, in a room of locals who've been on that ground for a long time. Yep. Well, in that regard, um, I was a chair of a system of water system in the North Branch on the summer. Um, and uh, the what we would call uh, ancillary benefits from the water source uh, control, uh, we should be focusing upstream, not lift up. Yeah. They ask farmers to change the way they do their farming so that the rich people can have a better savings. Right. Most of them don't know where it is in the Minnesota watershed. Yeah, my favorite quote, I'm in the one watershed one plan process for the canon because I'm an elected official down there. And my favorite quote from someone on that political committee was, I just want to catch crayfish again. You don't have to tell me how to do it, just make that creek have crayfish again. <laughs> Kevin, does Yeah, I was wondering if your segment is about the divide from rural to urban and then particularly in the divide between mandatory and voluntary practices, mentioned sort of like pitfalls of both voluntary and mandatory. Yeah. Is there one of those that fresh water supports more or is it kind of depend on the situation? We try to get locals to, and Brian's kind of working up an otter tail with, along these lines, he's an intern of ours right now. Um, we try to get locals to come up with their own ways of organizing the trade-offs, the trading. So you can, um, it's 
it doesn't work very well for the state to come in and mandate something. It's really hard to get through politically in the first place. It's like a heavy hammer, and then there's a lot of pushback. So that's not very effective. It's better to, to have the affected local parties rise up and say, we need to control this, maybe just in our area for our benefit. Um, I'm trying to organize a rural water district manager to talk to the legislature next week about the nitrogen bill, that, or the nitrogen rule that the Department of Ag is writing. I mean, rural water said districts, rural water associations um, are creating, they're like cities delivering water, but they deliver it to counties. And they do it because those people in the rural areas can't use their water anymore for the most part. It's too high nitrate. Um, or maybe there just wasn't that much water to begin with. But the rural water associations are also having problems finding water that's of sufficient quality to deliver to all these people they've now built pipes to. So those are the people you want to get organized and say, hey, there's a problem here with nitrogen in our water. You know, how can, how can we improve this setting? Um, and some of those towns are doing it. Like, I think it was Edgerton that maybe it was Laverne, one of those planted a lot of perennials in their in their drinking water source management area to reduce nitrogen input in that area. So we promote that kind of decision and keeping control in those local governments. Yeah. Um, when we get stakeholders, I imagine we still have to put some places in the rural urban divide, like Nineteen or Austin. Yeah. Um, it is hard, and you can't just ignore urban sources. You have to acknowledge that they are there. There is runoff from, you know, impermeable sources in that. But there are numbers to show how much that is. I was I accidentally said something to it was either Farm Bureau or Farm Union. I can't remember which is the more conservative of those two organizations. One is it was the head of one of those, the more conservative one. And we were talking about runoff and sediments, and he said, and "What about urban areas?" And I said, what are you talking about in urban areas? And he's like, parking lots. Like, what else? And he's like, well, just parking lots. And that's like 7%. You know, it's not much. Um, so you just have to have the numbers. Knowledge, yes, it is a contributor, but in Mankato, it's pretty clear. And, and the impact actually is huge on the city right now, like for nitrogen, for example. For, they have to get their water, drinking water standards now because of nitrogen runoff from the, the farm areas. So that's the other approach that we, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll get your question in a second. That's the other thing we're doing is trying to work with those small towns and the tax burden it is for them to deal with these issues and how it really will bankrupt a town or the citizens um, to deal with these problems. The, the annual assessments are like thousands of dollars, you know, for towns of 300 people. They just can't do it. So there's been a lot of good research at other institutions about the causes of some of these problems. And uh, now as we move on to trying to figure out solutions, you know, a lot of these problems that we have are really kind of uh, problems that we've never done research on in terms of solutions. We've never, we've never done research on how to stabilize these big blocks or how to, uh, you know, use different kinds of vegetative or engineering practices to control discharge in rivers. Um, it seems to me like, you know, that would be a logical next step is to put a little bit of money into actually studying some of the solutions. Yeah, and I that is what the scissors did. I mean, they tried to model those solutions, not implement, but model. Well, I'm talking more about the Yes. Yeah. yeah, and that's the stage we're on. I think that's the mood of the legislature right now, is to fund implementation. Um, you know, and, and maybe model the, the results of that, the result of the implementation. They're not, in this conversation we had with these influencers, you know, they acknowledge that you can't dial science back all the way. Science always has to keep happening, but they're ready to, to see change. Um, and I have to say that in the last thing I got funded from the LCCMR, we were kind of cautioned against the mood, and I did see it that day. I was at the legislature 
um, we took doctor off of everyone's title, which is everyone on the proposal. They just like, oh, it's just Dylan. <laughs> it's just Dylan and Karen. And and because we said that is just going to be a red flag, you know, that they they did not want to just be funding universities. Partner with locals. Yes. Brian. Brian gets the turn. So important. I mean, just to become aware of all the constraints they're working with, you know, what their small towns look like, what's still surviving there, you know, how their kids are leaving home, you know, how their churches are failing, just the, all the whole social picture out there um, is, I think, important to understand. Um, and then the the influences and the actors that you can meet there. I have um, people in the Minnesota River watershed, like around Montevideo. I was just really impressed with the land stewardship project activity there and the people that are already doing things the state isn't mandating, you know, blowing up some berms on the Minnesota River so it can flood its floodplain again. Um, there are some cool people out in these regions that are, are doing things um, just on their own, and those are important people to connect with. You don't want to assume that, you know, nobody is trying in those regions. Um, I guess those are the main things, yeah. And it's fun. I mean, in, in Minnesota, I think you probably, how many are from Minnesota? Okay, so quite a few are from Minnesota. Um, but I was recently down at Mankato and a lot of the faculty and the administrators and the people that come at the higher level there aren't from Minnesota. And I don't think that they're gonna advise their students on doing the best projects for their region. Um, if you're from Utah or Texas, you know, and you really don't understand anything between your house and the campus and that's the same way you drive every day. Or maybe you go to North Shore um, or your cabin, that's still, those are very um, isolated places and they're very different from the rest of Minnesota. School, lands, school landscape with three major ecotones and yeah, great exploring, canoeing. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a short question. So on the in slides where you were talking about um, state outreach and the Does the Well, I know that my director likes this nearly barely idea that headwaters of the Mississippi is where money should be invested. Um, we're one of the only nonprofits in water that focuses on groundwater, so we're looking a lot of a lot at groundwater sustainability, and um, so by both quantity and quality standpoint, so. We might, you know, Southeast has a certain kind of groundwater, but then the rest of the state has very different groundwater sources. So we're prioritizing projects differently because our issues are slightly different. It's not just surface water um, quality. That's not the only thing we look at. Um, I don't know if I answered your question very well, but. Okay. Yeah. And some, some of the other ones are like, how do we get at this problem? Like the problem of phosphorus um, or nitrogen, we can get at it through maybe the office of the legislative auditor and say, hey, these small town water treatment plants have to deal with this and bring their water up to standards and this is going to bankrupt the state. How are you going to do that? You have to plan for this. So you, you come at the problem from a different angle that means more to them. It still will result in reducing surface water loads of nutrients, but it's a different argument. So we try to come up with those. I'm not good at it yet. I don't. I play checkers, not chess. So <laughs> I'm still learning that part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have to have water. Yeah. Water is all you have. Okay. Thank you.